so glad you came today. And I'm excited about today. Sunday 242. I'm a little disappointed in the snow kept some people from getting in on today, but I believe we'll make it up. I know a few people did 242 last week because they anticipated their scheduling today being preventing them from having lunch with someone. But it's going to be a very special day. I've got a fresh word from the Lord for you that I believe you're going to uh, glean a lot from. And one of the uh, highlights of today's service is an ordination. We, from time to time, are privileged to send people into ministry to ordain uh, another generation of leaders in the earth. And so, today... Um, some of you, this will be an introduction because you haven't uh, ever met April and Andrew Everhart. But about a year or so ago, we began to have church services in Nicholasville, Kentucky. And we are founding a work there in a coffee shop. And it's exciting what God is doing and even more exciting about what God is about to do. But today, at this uh, part of our service, we're going to uh, bring April and Andrew up and then we're going to ordain them. I'll have the elders and pastors join me in a few moments. But first, I want Andrew and April to greet you and share a few words about what's going on. everyone. I am grateful. I Ordination is not anything I ever even considered for my life or thought about. And so I feel just so grateful for what God has done in my life and is doing in my life and through my life. Um, and I just keep thinking about like God doesn't just save us from things, but he saves us to something. And so um, Isaiah 61 is a scripture that has been kind of my mission statement over the last, since I was a teen. So I wanted to read that this morning. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. Foreigners will be your servants. They will feed your flocks and plow your fields and tend your vineyards. You will be called priests of the Lord, ministers of our God. You will feed on the treasures of the nations and boast in their riches instead of shame and dishonor. You will enjoy a double share of honor. You will possess a double portion of prosperity in your land and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be recognized and honored among the nations. Everyone will realize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation 
and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom in his wedding suit or a bride with her jewels. The sovereign Lord will show his justice to the nations of the world. Everyone will praise him. His righteousness will be like a garden in early spring with plants springing up everywhere. So I'm just holding to that as as we move forward in the ministry that we are called to do in the community that we're serving and I feel like this is a spring season, so I'm grateful. Yes. Well, she she said it all. I'm going to go sit down now. (laughs) So good, babe. Yeah, uh, let's just say uh, this has been uh, a a long road for me. I was telling uh, Pastor and Paula and Ben and Lindsay yesterday that uh, this marks, this, this coming April, this spring, marks 18 years since the Lord radically changed my life and since I first heard the call into ministry, right? And um, it, has been, it has been a long road with lots of uh, side paths and whatnot, but it's, it's so magnificent that the Lord um, has brought me to this place and, and he, he brought me first together with you, dear, and and um, and that was the most uh, life changing experience I ever had. Right, <laughs> best thing ever. But through that connection, um, what God was trying to to do in my life from that initial calling, He He allowed me to meet and and grow in love with all of you here at the river, and particularly Pastor and Paula and Ben and Lindsay. Um, I had a particular verse that was uh, the Lord gave me for the river. Kentucky as, as the teaching, preaching pastor there. Um, Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling of the endless treasures available to them in Christ Jesus. Honestly, this couldn't be more true because uh, if you want to ever get to know my story, I can, we can go more in depth, but I came from the streets of Atlanta as a drug dealer and Jesus radically changed my life. And yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it just been following what God's leading has been in my life all those years. And that's what I meant by like, he brought me to this point. This is a very holy moment for me particularly. And I, as you said, for you as well, um, I, The simple truth of the River Kentucky is God called and we're obeying. God called and we're obeying. And and, and, and Pastor uh, led us uh, to truly believe in what God was doing in there, in in the coffee shop. Because when I started a coffee shop, I wasn't necessarily looking to this. And God had a call on this. So we're super excited for all that God is doing. It has already done in the past year. Um, There has been... People who have come into the coffee shop who are so broken, so immensely broken and needing to hear that God loves them. One of the main things that God has taught me over all of these years to this point is that anyone who is outside of my eyes is created in his image and is deserving of the love that he has for them. And that is my job as a pastor to do that to whoever brings in. And there's a lot of people that come into the coffee shop and thankfully and hopefully more and more. So we want to invite them into the space to come and worship Jesus together. As I was praying through the space at the, at, at the coffee shop about the river, I was asking, Lord, what are you doing? What are you doing? You're stirring up in me. You're stirring all this up in our lives. What are you doing? And I simply heard him say, fill this place with praise. It was so simple. So, and I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to simply obey. So my prayer has been, and you guys pray this with me, um, free me, Lord Jesus, for joyful obedience. Joyful obedience. That's what I want to be the marker over what God is doing in the river there in Kentucky. A joyful obedience of worshiping the Lord and seeing people set free for his glory. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah. Uh, 
I'm going to ask the elders to join me on the platform. And any family members, uh, Lisa, if you and Rachel want to come. And April is Lisa's daughter, who is a member of the river, and Rachel's sister, who's a member of the river. She grew up here in our church youth group, Impact Fellowship product. So that's encouraging. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So look around here, Andrew and April. If the enemy tries to tell you that you're alone, just take a picture of this and say, <laughs> he's not a very good liar. <laughs> Although he's been practicing it for a long time. 1 Corinthians 3 and 5 says, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then... Neither is he who planted or he who neither is he who plants anything nor he who waters but God. Yes, but God. So the pressure's really off. Thank the Lord. Just keep on Jesus. keep on watering. Keep on planting. And then do some more watering and do some more planting. And then God will get all the glory because he's the only one that can give increase. I see some farmers in the room and you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can plant it and you can water it, but you can't make it grow. Amen? So when people brag on your garden... Say, well, I planted and watered it, but it's pretty because he decided that. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. You might be in a coffee shop, but you're the building. You are God's building. Isaiah 6 and 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, everybody say I. I. Here am I. I. Send me. me. In Acts 6 and 7, and the word of God increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem, in Nicholasville, (laughs) amen, in Wilmore, in Lexington, greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Hallelujah. I want you to get that great company, great increase in your heart and in your mind. Expect great things. Amen? The number increased greatly. So you're, right now you're just getting everything ready. God's setting it all up and boom, it's, it's going to be greatly. Amen? Stand with me if you would. Extend your hands, River family, to these folks as you become a part of what God's doing in Kentucky. I lay my hands on these, your vessels of transparency, pure and clean and ready for your use. I ordain, order them 
ascend them as they have obediently submitted themselves to your order and your leadership and your apostolic covering. We now pray the prayer of sending and we believe we breathe on them the anointing and release in them the power of the Holy Ghost that in their lives, through their prayer, through their touch, through their greeting, through their ministry and serving, you, God, will produce a great harvest in their community, in their realm of influence, and you will increase their authority, and you will increase their influence, and these people will come to them, Lord, like coming to a well. There'll be a well spring in their neighborhood. There'll be a well spring in Lexington. There'll be a well spring that people will come to them that are thirsty, come to them to get their source and their supply. And the word of God will increase greatly. And the word of God will well up in them. And you will give them tremendous revelation of your word. Ooh. Reveal yourself, reveal your son to them, through them, in them. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Go ahead and thank God for what he's doing right now. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Woo. Bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. I love you. Even got some oil on it. <laughs> there you go. Excited. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are holy, Lord. You are great. You are mighty. Thank you, Jesus. I love you. They are truly like children to us. Lisa, I guess it's okay if we share your kids. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. As we get ready for our uh, declaration, we would like for all uh, the classes, the children can be released right now. You can go to your places. As well, we'd like to mention, if you're a first time guest, we wanna welcome you and thank you for coming out here. And we wish you to go to the hayloft. The hayloft is right out those doors and we would love to meet you, get better acquainted with you, so if you're a first-time guest, or if you've been here a few times and you have not yet visited the Hayloft, we just want to welcome you. So go out there, and somebody will meet you and greet you, and we'd love uh, to get to know you better. So let's all stand here one more time. We're going to read this declaration together. It says, get it up there. Read it together. I will read it. <laughs> In Acts 2, God promised to pour out His Spirit upon all flesh in these last days. I declare that as I pour out my love for Jesus through my giving, it will be multiplied. To advance God's kingdom in Jesus' mighty name. Yes. And we also have black boxes at every exit if you want to drop your tithe and offering off that way. Amen. I'm so grateful for our media team, and I know they 
run into some snags. We are increasing and in moving our, our, uh, moving our broad scope of what we do in terms of media. We're online in a lot of different places and different ways, and we're growing how we do that. We're trying to improve the quality of that. We're going into a new software systems. Um, as the money is available, it's very expensive to do what we do. So uh, if God puts it on your heart to give to media, hopefully we can um, get out of some of these technical glitches and so forth. But they've been working really hard. And uh, so when you, when you work hard, sometimes uh, things don't always work like you want them to. And sometimes you have to learn as you go. And that's Okay, right? We're getting a really good uh, result of what we're doing. Tomorrow night, elders, we are meeting over in the chapel at 6.30. We have an elders meeting. We do this about once or twice a year, and I'm excited to um, get th this new group of elders together. If you're a pastor or a former pastor among us, if you're an honorary elder among us, you're welcome in those meetings, okay? I want you to know that. Um, 6.30 tomorrow night in the old chapel. Everybody say 242. Two. Two, two. Amen. Well, I'm glad we came an hour early because that way we can m make up for it and go an hour longer. Does that, <laughs> that sound good? I always want to do that. We've got plenty of time, right? It's just... Just now, 10 o'clock. Thank the Lord. I love it. It makes a preacher comfortable. Just relax. What do we say around here? Love God, love people. Amen? The love God part, it's really sometimes hard to discern, and we give ourselves an A plus sometimes. Oh, I love God. Right? And then we get to that love people part. But you know what the truth is? How can you love God whom you have not seen if you cannot love your brother whom you have seen? If you've got a problem with people, you've got a problem with God. I got one, amen. I've heard pastors say... Man, I love church. I love God. It's just people I have a problem with. <laughs> well, that's honest, but it's also the truth that you need help. We need help. I need help. We, we are God's children. He loves all of us, and it's up to us to learn to love all of us. Right. Amen? Amen. So I hope you're listening. I hope those of you that are online will stay right there because I've got just a real quick little message that I believe is powerful to your future and powerful to the kingdom of God as we impact the darkness of this age. It's really important that we get it together on loving one another. Amen? Amen. Everybody say, one another. Why do we have Sunday 242? Is it just a, a fun idea? Is it just something we dreamed up and thought, oh, that'd be cute? And if you see it that way, you probably won't participate and you'll miss out on something great that God is doing. You've heard the testimonies of these wonderful people that got involved and in, in, uh, got looped into a, to a lunch and what the great fruit that that has produced in their lives. We are a church of small groups. Amen? We're not a church who has a lot of small groups. We are a church of small groups. And it's human nature. It's God's way. It's always been that way, and it will always be that way. And I've heard pastors say, oh, we tried small groups and they don't work. Oh, they're working all right. 
<laughs> they may not be working the way you planned and they, you may not be in on it, but they're working. I've, I've done this experiment a, a, a bunch of times. You have a group of people like we have here today and you say, everybody stand up and get in groups of four. And it's like you all the way back to kindergarten. One, two, three. And you look around, you got groups of two, groups of one, groups of five, groups of seven. We all forget how to count. When the pressure's on and you've got to face somebody and you've got to do a simple little project. But guess what? If I say, ladies and gentlemen, God bless you, you're dismissed, have a great day. And then in about two and a half minutes, everybody's in a small group. It's so organic. Somebody will talk to somebody. And some group will get together. And if it's a married people, it's generally a group of four. But it's just hard for us to wrap our head around getting, these, getting past ourselves and doing the uncomfortable. And you say, oh, I'm this and I'm that. No, you're, you're one of God's children. We're all the same. You don't get to call yourself introvert, extrovert, blah, 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 all these labels and whatnot. And all of us have problems talking to other people. I wasn't born this way. Matter of fact, I was probably the most shy in my class in high school. Insecure, introverted. I'd take an F before I would present to the class. Just give me an F. In college, I took an F in uh, one of my music classes because they wanted me to get up and present some intervals or something. <laughs> That's right. If God can help me, he can help you. Right. With God, all things are possible. Here I stand talking to you. And a whole lot of folks I don't even know and on, the, on the web. And I love them and I love you and it's fun and I never regretted a day of getting to know people. Amen? Amen. So why do we do this? Number one, we want to create an atmosphere that's hard to leave. The more people you know, the more people you're intimate with, the more people you have deep relationships, meaningful relationships with, the harder it is to leave when one offends you. You know how many people have left a church of a thousand because one offended them? 999 people love them with all their heart and are good and honest and caring and loving and want to take care of them and one person offended them, they're gone. Happens all the time. Or a handful of people out of a hundred. Still doesn't make any sense, does it? If you've got 90 for you and 10 against you, that's good odds. I don't know any politician that's ever won by those margins. <laughs> Amen? Hey, you ought to be grateful. If you've got 51%, just be happy. Whew, a lot of folks don't like me, but man, I got my, I got my 51, right? I'm winning. <laughs> Woohoo! Number two, create a climate that spiritual growth is promoted and is the normal. Yeah. Yeah. See, I don't mean to be critical, but a lot of churches I've visited and been a part of, spiritual stagnation was the normal. You, you got your one, two, three, and you sit down and you're like, I'm good. I didn't kill anybody this week. Didn't cheat on my wife. I don't even think I cussed. I'm good. That's the normal in many places. But here, we want spiritual growth to be the normal. Challenging you, pushing you, pulling on you, stretching you. And we're just going to stretch a little bit today, okay? It's okay to stretch. Don't be afraid to stretch a little bit. It's good for you. You can't build muscle till you stretch first. It's, it's more healthy that way. Number three, to sustain an environment that is easy to come home to. 
See, the devil wants to tell people that have left the river that, boy, coming back is going to be so hard because people are going to da 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 They're going to think this, and they're going to think that, and they're going to ask this, and going to ask that. And how many of you found out that those voices are lies? You come back, and all you get is warmth and hugs and embrace, and before you know it, you feel comfortable again. Amen. How many of you ever left the river and came back? It's okay. Okay, most of you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I mean, Paula and I have resigned a few times. Y'all didn't know it, but we did. <laughs> How many know the father stood on the porch with arms open wide for that prodigal son? And when prodigals come home, I don't ask them, why, why'd you leave us? What's your problem? Where have you been? Amen? It's okay. It's okay. Oh, you went to the pig pen. Okay. You're home now. And we're not eating corn husk. We're eating a fatted calf, Jack. Amen? Put a ring on your finger and a robe around your neck. Come on, somebody. Come on home. Yeah. Woo! Everybody look at that camera and say, welcome home. Welcome home. In Acts chapter 2, they that gladly received his word were baptized, 241. Is that going to work, Brett, the scripture? I don't know. Acts 241. They that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Somebody say diversity. diversity. Say, if you see 3,000 people, I'm almost positive there'll be one you don't like. I'm pretty sure somebody in that group is going to give you a dirty look. Somebody in that group is going to be dressed a little funky, and you're not going to like it. Amen? 3,000, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 is where we get our Sunday 242 title, name. Handle, right? And they, everybody say they, they, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Now, up until about three days ago, I read this scripture in a kumbaya kind of mindset. Oh, these wonderful people got baptized, got the Holy Ghost, and they continued steadfast from house to house. Come on over to my house, honey. Oh, come on, I got some bread for you. And I just had this beautiful picture of all these clean-cut, nice little Christians that all looked alike and sounded alike and dressed alike and had the same mindsets and political views and all. I, up until three or four days ago, for some reason, I saw it in the context of, a, of our church. Trying to get our loving, warm congregation of people to just go house to house and get, a, get involved in a small group and, and love one another and take meals to each other and invite people out to eat and go to Max and Irma's or Steak and Shake or Waffle House. That's just my three places that I go. <laughs> well, guess what? I'm going to raise a question today that the Lord raised to me three or four days ago, he said, who is they? Who is they? 3,000 they. Who is that? 
Who's the they in that verse? Well, you know how the Bible is. It'll tell you if you ask. They were devout Jewish men from every nation under heaven and some proselytes who were visiting Jerusalem to commemorate Shavuot and thank the Lord for giving them the Torah. So let me break this to you. Diversity isn't just people from different Christian backgrounds. And we, we pat ourselves on the back because we can fellowship with somebody from a different name over their building. A Methodist can hang out with an Episcopalian and a Catholic can sit down and have coffee with a Pentecostal. We get all pumped about that. We are rocking it. We are. You talk about unity. Woohoo! We got Mennonite people getting the Holy Ghost. We are rocking the culture shift. Amen? Well, that's awesome. And I'm thankful that we got this far, Brother Curtis. We're, we're loving this. But I got news for you. Heaven's going to be mighty diverse. You hear what I'm saying? Here's, here's the they, okay? Acts 2 and verse 5. There were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. Acts 2 verse 9 15 different nationalities, cultures, languages, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, oh my word, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues and the wonderful works of God. Now I'm not going to try to explain how much diversity there was here, but I want to point out a few things that are represented in our culture today that was represented in these groups. I studied the Parthians just a little bit, and these, this was a group of folks that had come from a long way away, and they venerated the trees and nature. We have some folks like that in the world today. And one of the things the Parthians had, you have that picture there. Can you see that? <clears throat> this is a statue that, that was pictured to represent the strict dress codes the Parthians carried religiously. A lot of religions, this was in the first century, but we're 21 centuries out and still there are groups today who put a lot of emphasis on the dress code, whether written or unwritten. I've been in groups where if you didn't have a suit and tie, you felt out of place. I've been in groups where if you came in in a suit and tie, you felt out of place. It wasn't a sign on the wall. It was just the way the culture looked at you. It's like if you don't have on skinny jeans and a skin-tight T-shirt and work out every week, you don't fit in here, right? Right? the fake glasses and the cropped hair or whatever. And then there's other groups where if you don't have on the suit and the tie and your wife's hair up high, you just don't feel like you fit in here. There's groups of all stripes and shapes and colors, and we do this to ourselves. We, we do this to each other, and it, it's not necessarily what Acts 2 
had, but the Parthenians that were there had to somehow get enough Holy Ghost to get past meeting house to house with folks that didn't have all the pleats and the and the wrap and the the hair. That hairdo is in style right now <laughs> at Lancaster High School. That's the one right there. You want to get a job at a fast food restaurant, get that hair right there and you're in. I don't know about them leggings, but <laughs> those people believed that was the way and they got the Holy Ghost and they began to meet house to house. Say, well, I, I don't, you know, I don't know. People don't agree with, uh, people don't seem to agree with me on issues and this and that and the other. You got to get past that. Pontus got its name from Pontos, the Greek mythical god of the sea. So here's some folks that believe that the god of the sea is the one that we worship, and we're going to believe in that and. They come to Jesus and they get baptized and they get filled with the Holy Ghost and they meet, continue. See, when it said they continued, it's, it's not like we see continued. You know, we see continued as we start doing Bible studies and, and reading the Bible and continue in the Christianity we grew up in. These folks continued in the apostles' doctrine they'd never heard. They continued in the apostles' doctrine, which went completely opposite of anything they had ever dreamed of hearing, because the Holy Ghost fell on them, and they got baptized with a love that took over every part of their being and their thinking and their old mindsets, and they became a new creature out of that religion, the Cretes. I found where Paul addresses and, and kind of throws the book at the Cretes when he's writing to Timothy. The elders and those appointing them know Titus 1, 5 through 9 well, as we did today. We're less familiar with the history of Crete that made their appointment so urgent. Near the heart of Paul's imperatives for Titus is this affirmation of an ancient statement of mysterious origins where he says Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. He literally called the Cretans out as idle bellies in Titus 1 and 12. <laughs> but they, the Cretans, continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in breaking bread and in prayer and fellowship with one another from house to house, they, these weirdos, these people that Paul took the liberty to just call them out, right? They. And number four, I will stop with number four. I won't go through all 15, but number four, he says there were Arabs. We can relate to that because the Arabs to this day are known for the Muslim faith. And in the first century, they were Muslims that showed up in Jerusalem and got converted, got the Holy Ghost. We've had some Muslims in our, our uh, prison services get converted to come and know Jesus. On the college campuses, you'll find these, these of the Muslim faith coming to the belief that Jesus is Lord. And they, everybody say they. they. They continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. What was the apostles' doctrine mentioned in Acts chapter 2, 42? It wasn't the epistles because they weren't written yet. The apostles' doctrine was simply the teachings of Jesus Christ. That's a revelation. And they continued in it. So I've shared this for the last few years. 
And I want to share it again because it bears repeating and we get a better memory from repetition. 53 times in your Bible, you will find the phrase, one another. Caring for one another. Sharing with one another. Helping one another. Strengthening one another. Loving one another. Supporting one another, praying for one another, fasting for one another, serving one another, lifting one another, encouraging one another, carrying one another, forgiving one another, listening to one another, speaking to one another, greeting one another, to provoke one another. Bear ye with one another, forbearing one another, be kind one to another, be tender hearted one to another. See, in diversity, it's harder to be kind than it is around people that agree with everything you say. But when you disagree, Be kind. I can do that. One of the fruit of the Spirit is kindness, gentleness. Not many souls have been won with a sledgehammer or a hatchet or or a legal case that you're right and they're wrong. You can prove somebody wrong theologically, but you're not going to convert them. You can win an argument and lose a soul. Be kind to one another. Be tender-hearted one to another. Teaching and admonishing one another. Comfort one another. Edify one another. Exhort one another. We've got to do that too. Amen? And consider one another. This is a word the Lord gave me in 2022. We are truly better together. The word of the Lord, this is the generation that will see great exponential apostolic revival. This generation will see and experience miracles, signs, and wonders. This generation will see the prodigals the wounded, and the wayward swarm to our altars. The Lord gave us that word a year ago. It's the word of the Lord. It is a true word. So finally, how will we do this? Isaiah 62 and 4 says, Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land be any more termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hept Ziba and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. The greatest picture of unity in the earth is the marriage of one man and one woman to each other because God chose Adam and Eve to reflect himself in the earth. He reflected himself in Adam, who was the first Adam and the perfect man, and then realized, God can realize, amen? He realized Adam's not good alone. All right, men? Admit it. You're not good alone. You need a help meet. Look at your wife and say, thank you for helping me. Thank you. But with man and woman, God could reflect his love for us in the earth. And so he designed the unit of marriage. And a lot of folks do it wrong 
But if you do it right, it's heaven on earth. If Jesus builds the house, amen, if the Lord builds the marriage, that's why young people, make sure the Lord brings you the right one. Don't get confused of lust and love. Don't let the devil confuse you about lust and love. Amen. 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 So, the church has never needed unity like it needs it now. The marriage unit is the example of how much God loves us. And the unity of a couple on that wedding day. What God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. That's a picture of how we ought to love one another. That's a picture of how if we are willing to sacrifice, if we are willing to forbear, if we are willing to be kind, if we are willing to give of ourselves, we can have a love relationship with one another. So, no matter the cost, no matter the offense, no matter how much water has gone under the bridge, no matter how rudely they have treated you, no matter how irresponsible they have been, no matter how many times they have fallen, no matter how unethical they have conducted themselves, no matter, no matter, no matter, let's pull together. Let's love one another. Let's fight together for the one cause of the kingdom of the living God. Let's be one mind, one accord, in one place. Let's do one lunch, one grow group, one congregation, one business, one community, one city, one county, one state, one nation, one people around this globe. Let's show the world what Jesus looks like, what love looks like. As I've said many times, somebody give love a face. Amen? Amen. All right. Somewhere near you is a piece of paper. As you came through the door today, you were supposed to get this 242 House to house sketch. In the book or in the uh, envelope pouch in front of you, you should find an ink pen. If you don't have a paper or an ink pen, raise your hand. The ushers have both, and they will help you to locate that. I need one, Nathan. I don't need a pen. I just need a paper. Thank you. Thank you, ushers. Look at those great ushers we have. Mighty men and women of God serving in a great way in this house. So we're going to have about 10 minutes of utter chaos This is the part of service that my wife cannot stand. Please don't. Please don't do this. We learned this uh, approach from the art of neighboring. So, can everybody hear me now? Listen carefully to the instructions and you will have a blast doing this. And it's going to kind of stimulate some... Um, relationship, some connection. If you're a guest with us, go ahead and play along. We want you to participate. We don't want anybody to miss out on the fun and the glory of this little moment. But we learned this from the art of neighboring. So you see the, the, the nine squares. You are here in the middle square. That's you. So put your name right there in the middle square right now. Go. That leaves eight squares. Now, if you picture your neighborhood, if you live in a neighborhood, 
neighbors. I live in the country, but I still have neighbors. Somebody lives in front of you, somebody behind you, somebody on each side of you, and then they're diagonal four more, and that's eight. In this room, if it were full today, you would have, and you weren't on the front row or the back row, you would have eight people that you could fill in. So we're going to cut the number in half, okay? We're going to let you do four squares. So you may have to skip a row or skip down to the end of the pew row there and uh, find those people. But uh, John, right behind you, I'm going to play with John here just a minute. Does everybody know John? He's new. Hey, John. Right behind you, that guy's name is Todd. He don't bite all, all the time. The lady right in front of you I haven't met yet. So, you, John, your job is to tell me her name, okay? And then over there beside you is Janessa. And sitting next to you is your lovely wife, whom you know. I think you know her. So you got your four people. Did everybody catch on to that? All right. So here's what you're going to do. Real quick, you're going to uh, fill in the squares that represent the four people you're looking for. And then with their name, in the, uh, that's the first level of relationship. To know someone's name, that's just the first level of relationship. Do you know Dee Dee? Yes, I know Dee Dee. She's that lady with the green leaves on her shirt. That's Dee Dee. I know Dee Dee by name. Second level is something you know about them, like a church background, their occupation, their level of schooling, or what school they attended. If, do they have kids? That sort of level two. And then we're going to go just a little deeper today and discover something about that person you did not know, something about them that maybe most people don't know. I don't know what that'll be, but they'll tell you something about themselves, interesting or uh, historic, I don't know. But we're going to find out about each other just for a few minutes. Nobody leave. Ushers, don't let people sneak out because this is the fun part. We're gonna, the doors. We're going to pray and worship when this is over. So you got 10 minutes to get four names and information. 10 minutes, go.
If you have four names filled in, raise your hand. You got four done, raise your hand. Okay, some of you still working? All right, we'll give you one more minute. One minute. 